Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the October 2nd meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. If you could all join us in a moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes or additions to today's agenda? Uh, Chair Friend, we don't have any additions or corrections to the agenda today. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to begin now with uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us either on items that are not on today's agenda, items that are on today's consent agenda, or if you're unable to stay for the regularly scheduled uh, regular agenda items, it's an opportunity for you to speak on those items as well. You'll have three minutes. Anybody like to address us today, please feel free to step forward. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Supervisors. Uh, last week I went to the AMBAG meeting. Uh, that held, that was held in uh, Corlitos. AMBAG is a, uh, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. It's nothing more than a Soviet. On the uh, uh, DIAS, when people came in, the public, uh, there were only four copies of the agenda. We're talking uh, three counties and cities and every one of those counties, the public is purposely not informed. Only two people spoke, uh, one of them was myself and another one uh, where you specifically, the DA is specifically trying to criminalize his free speech. Um, this was put together uh, some time ago by our friend Bruce McPherson and Sam Farr. 20 years ago, they met at a Hyatt hotel in which they were sponsored by PG&E. I've talked many times about the PG&E running SEEK, which is a uh, energy cartel, and that they have contracts with ICLEI, which is no more than a front for the United Nations and the UN. Um, we find that the censorship goes on. It was Zach Friend and Leopold that successfully shut down two speeches and uh, apparently uh, the Grange and other people took those threats seriously, but not yet by, by Jim Hart. Um, at this particular meeting, we saw AMBAG uh, make resolutions to lobby the state uh, Sacramento. Yet none of you were uh, considered, the other members of the board were not asked whether you wanted to do this endorsement. This is totally illegal, it's totally unconstitutional because the UN and the World Bank is involved, it's a violation of the Logan Act. The people involved in this have been the Trilateral Commission, which included its found, one of its founding members was David Packard, he controls our community foundation, and also Diane Feinstein, who couldn't figure out she had a red Chinese uh, person uh, being her chauffeur for the last 20 years. And it's funded by the uh, Panetta Institute. These two members belong to a COPA organization founded by Saul Alinsky, who dedicated his book to Lucifer. Here we got Leon Panetta, together with Zach Friend and Mr. Coonerty. This is all by that. You look up COPA, which I have here. Uh, COPA is supported uh, by the Panetta Institute. This is a Panetta machine. We have here the communist Chinese agent that gave Bruce McPherson and tens of thousands of dollars. I encourage you to break your contacts with this Soviet, which is AMBAG. The uh, Committee of Economic uh, Development said that their purpose is to get rid of local government and have it run regionally, just like the Soviet Union and the European Union uh, did before. Break those ties. This is illegal operation. You're, you're keeping the people out of it. Two people out of three counties in all those cities. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us during public comment? Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the SEU internal organizer for the county workers. I wanted to know, I think um, Mr. Spalacio was going to do a presentation about um, work evaluation. I just don't know, is it number six? Item or? six, yes, okay. on the regular agenda. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us during public comment? Good morning, Board of Soups. I haven't been here in a while, okay. Uh, I have a problem right now. The other day, well, actually on Tuesday, my studio caught on fire. 
and uh, my studio was full with a lot of art. So uh, a lot of art got burned. I mean, I'm dealing with that right now. I'm trying to figure out, you know, I called the fire department. I went down to SoCal Fire Department, and uh, I went on there. They've got a phone outside outside their door, and I picked up the phone, and I, and, and I talked to somebody, but they didn't send anybody out. So I don't know what to do when uh, when your how when your stuff catches on fire and it destroys it. I mean, I don't have a lot of a. Uh, uh, lawyers or insurance and stuff like that. I, I don't deal with that. I had the stroke and then and I, that put me off of a lot of thoughts, but I don't know uh, how you guys can help me, but I mean, you, you maybe get the fire department out there or, or the sheriff's department or whatever. I, I'd like somebody to come out and check the property. It's 2613 Monterey Avenue in SoCal. I'd like somebody to check out, you know, what's, what's going on and see how they can help me. Uh, otherwise, I'm discombobulated and confused. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really like losing all this art, and it's, it's spent years. And some of it was encaustic, which is wax, and that went up. Some of it old dolls from the 1800s. But and when you see all that stuff with black and char marks on it, kind of gives you an idea that a uh, that is screwed up, you know, that's no longer sellable or showable. And uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, I've come down to you guys over the years for lots of things. And uh, sometimes argue, sometimes make friends. You, just, you, know, you never know what's going to go on. And I don't really know. I've only got three minutes, but I don't really know what to, uh, what to say. But I wanted to get that out of my system and see if, if possibly somebody, you guys know some access of uh, where I could go to uh, to help out uh, uh, with the fire damage. Okay, so I'll sit back here. Oh, thank okay. you, Sup Supervisor Weeple. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jeffy. Uh, please uh, feel free to come over to the board office, and uh, my staff will see if they can what they can do to help you out. Okay. Anybody else like to address us? Good morning, Mr. Binding. Welcome back, Paul Binding. Agricultural Commissioner, Division Manager of the Mosquito Vector Control Association. Um, mosquito Vector Control, not the association. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite you, if you have your uh, calendar free, on Friday, October 26th, from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock, to our open house. And uh, your board, county employees, public officials, and the general public are all invited to our open house. Uh, to be held at our newly renovated office and laboratory at 640 Capitola Road at 7th Street in Live Oak. The open house is an opportunity for us to thank all who supported our program, delivering services of mosquito control, rodent, and yellow jacket tick and fly manage management. <clears throat> we are thankful for the support of your board uh, and uh, especially general services and other departments in improving our infrastructure and providing us with a laboratory with which to monitor diseases spread by mosquitoes and ticks and to uh, track resistance to mosquitoes and uh, conduct resistance to mosquito sites and conduct surveillance for uh, invasive species of mosquitoes, such as the invasive aedes we told you about. Uh, the open house will have a Halloween theme, um, bats, rats, bed bugs, oh my and uh, refreshments and equipment such as an airboat and eight-wheel drive ATV. Uh, our staff are eager to demonstrate and answer questions the public may have. And uh, as a public health agency, our open house is an opportunity to share what we do with the, pu with the uh, um, public we protect. So uh, thank you and I hope you have October 26th. Uh, from four to seven o'clock, that's a Friday. I know it's the same night as the sheriff's uh, trunks for treats, but perhaps you could bring your kids or grandchildren and, and uh, visit this, uh, both of them at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Binding, um, usually Halloween-themed uh, uh, parties feature fake things. <laughs> uh, no. I'm a little worried at your shop. We're gonna have a few uh, rats running around, but uh, <laughs> some of them will be in uniform. You don't sell them. <laughs> 
Yeah, Mr. 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 Chair, if I could, Mr. I think Vice this department is one of those that people kind of ask us on occasion, what are we doing this for? But it is really for, uh, could be a severe uh, health issue, uh, public safety issue, and uh, it's something that um, the problems we've avoided in this this era is, uh, or this area is um, you can't tell, but we have avoided many, and it's very much needed. And I really want to say I appreciate. I know the whole board does appreciate you. your efforts. For I have a very uh, devoted and uh, uh, a very generous staff that's uh, devoted to their jobs, very professional. And uh, we'll find out just how well they do because the state is going to do their review of us today. It's the California Department of Public Health, and we have a cooperative agreement with them. And uh, so they go through all our books and they look over uh, all our data, um, look over our vehicles, and and make sure we have our our noses clean and and uh, we're doing our job. So uh, thank you for your support once again. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us in public comment? Any other events you'd like us with animals and insects and bugs you'd like to invite us to? Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll close public comment. We'll move toward the consent agenda. The action on the consent agenda will be items 11 to 18. We'll start uh, with Supervisor Caput. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Caput. Anything you'd like to pull or discuss further? Uh, no, uh, let me... Uh Uh, no, uh, there's on item 17, I guess, uh, I was just looking at it and the, uh, it says, out of curiosity, it's not a big deal, but uh, it says contract number, well, C3974, and then uh, we go over to contract, it jumps over to contract uh, three, uh, uh, 3977. Is, is there a, a contracts in between those two or do, is that just a, uh, the way, that it could be a contract in between 75, 76 and all that? Yeah, there could be other contracts. Those, those are just numerically uh, given to contracts as they come in, and there could be other contracts in between those. Yeah. With other organizations, for example. <clears throat> okay, yeah. so they're not necessarily always in order. No. Right, okay. And then the other is uh, just a small thing. Uh, it, uh, on page uh, of 17C, um, Page, uh, page one on contract 3977. Uh, it, it doesn't have the full address of the contract. That's just probably a typo. Mm -hmm. and they, they left out the city. Uh, we can look into that. It should be, it should include the full address. I mean, if correct. it's a contract, it should be a full address, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, we'll it's just probably, it, it's omitted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Kavik. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, item number 16, I just noticed uh, we we're posting a notice for three vacancies on the Resource Conservation District. This is a very valuable district, and I would encourage people who are uh, interested in our um, environmental, uh, our environment, uh, to consider this seriously. It's um, It's been a, a really an outstanding district that has helped us in more ways than one, and I, I can't let this go without mentioning uh, the invaluable um, contribution by the late Karen Christensen and what she did to make this a reality and really bring it to the forefront and how we can protect some of our natural resources, waterways, and so forth. Uh, she was an outstanding woman. Uh, this is a great um, district, and I, uh, I think that uh, if anybody is interested, I would really uh, encourage them to apply for, to be on the board of directors of that, of that district. Thank you, Mr. McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, good morning. Uh, just a couple comments. Uh, first on item number 17, the AB 109 contracts, I really want to acknowledge probation and Fernando for including some really good uh, outcome measures and um, and get making sure we're uh, serving both the people in the programs and the community well. Um, and on item number 18, which is the notice of completion for the Davenport Recycles Water Project, I just want to thank Public Works and Ken Edler for their really outstanding work. This is a win-win-win for the community. Uh, 
Uh, it's good for the environment, it's good for community and the rates, and it's good for the North Coast farmers. Um, it's an exciting project, and I just want to thank Public Works for their, for their work. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, Chair, the uh, agenda has left me speechless. I have nothing to comment on. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much I want to say about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, is there a motion for the consent agenda? <clears throat> I, I move the consent agenda. Uh, we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to the first <coughs> item of the regular agenda, which is item six, which is to consider a report and study session on the county's continuous process improvement initiative known as the Primo Santa Cruz program, and direct the CAO to return in February 2019 with the status update as outlined in the memo of the CAO. Uh, we have an attachment, which is the Primo year at a glance. And uh, Ms. Benson, will you be the one doing the presentation today? Yes, I am. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. For the record, I'm Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, with the honor of leading our work to implement continuous process improvement here at County of Santa Cruz. <coughs> Eric Frederick joins me today at the table as part of my, uh, our team to pull this together. We have about 45 minutes of content. It won't all be me talking. We have a couple of video clips that are embedded in the presentation. So I'm going to start moving and uh, talk a little bit about the purpose of the study session today. So really our purpose is to introduce both to the board and the public our efforts to implement continuous process improvement. Um, Carlos is going to provide a little bit of background on how does this, this effort fit into our overall vision for management uh, here at the county. Then we'll go into some core principles and concepts and why they matter around lean and continuous process improvement and then the plan itself for our first year of implementation. So with that, I'd like to ask Carlos to give us a little bit of, a, of an overview. A uh, little more than a year ago, uh, when I was appointed CAO, I laid out a work plan uh, for the board and for the public on what I thought were the priorities for the county in terms of uh, process. And so I laid out a uh, plan that included uh, strategic planning as a first step uh, I think strategic direction is critical for any organization because that is how uh, we make priorities and how we make choices. Strategic planning really is about making hard choices, deciding to focus on certain things, and by definition, not focusing on other things. And doing that as both uh, an organization, both the board and our staff, as well as the community. And we've done that. During the last year, we spent more than a year developing the strategic plan, and it's now in place, and it's a wonderful document that lays out uh, focus areas and goals. So the next thing is to implement that. To implement the strategic plan, we have a two an operation plan and a two-year budget. The operational plan will have specific <coughs> objectives and key results that will operationalize the strategic plan and that will be tied to a two-year budget. As you know, the budget is the board's most important policy document in that it, because it's how you put resources behind what you think are priorities. And therefore, that is coming up this current year. Current year. We're also in the process of developing performance measurement. And that's how we evaluate the various objectives and programs that we implement to, um, to bring the, the strategic plan into reality. So it really is about planning, implementing and evaluating. But the question is, how do you get better at what you do? Um, once you have implemented and evaluated and you want to improve, how do you do, bring that into the culture of the organization? So that is where this uh, movement comes in. It's really about continuous process improvement and about continually becoming better, improving. After we've planned, we've implemented, We've evaluated, then we continually get better at what we do, and it becomes part of our culture and part of every employee's um, mission in their job. And so um, Lisa will now point out how this fits into the strategic plan and into our values and mission. Thank you, Carlos. So why now? Uh, what you see in front of you is some excerpts from the strategic plan. And clearly, uh, continuous improvement is an explicitly named focus area within our um, county operational excellence uh, goal. But I want to make sure that we also focus on 
some other aspects that are uh, aligned with continuous process improvement. And really it is that focus on customer experience and customer voice. It's a focus on the county workforce and fully engaging them in the work. Um, and as well as innovation and, and looking for efficient, improved efficiency and effectiveness. Another aspect, and we'll get into this more as I, I talk about concepts and principles of lean, is the opportunity to implement continuous improvement is really an opportunity to, to live our values. As I go into a greater depth, you'll see it really is around collaboration. It's around uh, respect and support and transparency in the work we do. It's about uh, empowering employees to be involved in making the work processes they engage in every day better from their perspective. So uh, it's really a great way to, to walk the talk of the values we've, uh, we've committed to in the strategic plan. So with that, I want to get a little bit into the, into the, the background and co about continuous process improvement. Um, it really is a, work base, a, a workplace philosophy, a management system. Um, it's not just tools that you apply to problem solving. At, at its base, fundamentally, it's around that incremental improvements, continuously making incremental improvements, can lead to big changes in performance and the results we're looking for in serving the public. And again, uh, this really comes back to employees and involving them in this work. They are this work. Um, CPI is not new. Its roots are in uh, a long history of industrial engineering and it's been practiced for, gosh, well over half a century. Um, there's a, a lot of different schools of thought on CPI management approaches. We've chosen LEAN. Uh, it's not an acronym, it's just LEAN. Uh, it comes out of the work of Dr. W. Ed Edwards Deming in the in mid-50s and 60s where uh, he did a lot of work in post-war Japan on manufacturing and uh, the Toyota production model was where a lot of these um, concepts were really honed and practiced. In the 80s, it came back to the U.S. and really with a full court press in, in uh, manufacturing, but it's in probably the last 10 to 15 years, started to be used in the public sector with, with really effective results. So next we're gonna do, this is part of our video part of the uh, study session today. Um, Eric's gonna have to sort of, we wanna skip a little bit of the opening, but just as a, a quick, um, so quick, quick background, this is a woman from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, we specifically chose something that was not super fancy, not super glitzy, because we want it to be clear this is very straightforward ideas. Um, you don't have to have, it's good to have help and expertise from consultants and folks who have done this before, but it's not critical. So with that, it, this is about 12 minutes, and then we'll move forward. Process improvements. Continuous improvement can make dramatic change in your life and in your organizations. What I wanna do is just give you three quick concepts. So if this is something that makes sense to you, I'd like you to do a couple of things. First of all, if there's a challenge in your life that you're working on, instead of thinking of it as a problem, thinking of it as a process that could be improved. If, for example, you're trying to improve your health, as I think everybody is, maybe you'd like to incorporate more water in your daily activities. What would be an easy strategy would be to have glasses available, have <coughs> bottled water, there's even some here. I like to have a mug that has my children's pictures on it so I can realize this is why I'm focused on adding more water in my daily life. What most organizations and people are trying to do, though, is to streamline a process to make it better. And how that works best is if you focus and think about the process involved. In continuous improvement, there's a term called Kaizen, which is a Japanese term to really focus. Focus on the process. What's working well and where could it be improved? When I worked at Pfizer, we were trying to find a way to remove one day out of the financial close. 
What that means in the accounting world is you close the books, you turn off the general ledger, and then you do what you have to do to adjust the records and make the reports available. Two to three days is a best practice. We were not at two to three days. So what we did is we got a group of people together, some people call them SMEs, subject matter experts, and we did what I call the 69 cent post-it note exercise. Over 90% of process improvement is done by process mapping. And all that means is identifying the steps in a process and looking to the value that they add. Are they important? If they are, who says? Have things changed? So we had our subject matter experts in a room, we put our post-it notes on the wall, and we said, let's go back and check with people and see if this is still important. We came back about a week later. Hard to believe. One of the biggest steps that we were doing, we thought we were doing for our customers, the businesses. When we asked the businesses what value they got from that, they all said the same thing. We thought you were doing it because you had to. I call that the company salute. <laughs> Nobody knows. Everybody thinks it's done for the other person. We literally <coughs> took one day out of the financial close. Now, if you were an accountant or a finance executive, you'd be real happy when I said that. It's a big deal. Okay, focus on the situation. Another thing I'd like to suggest is make it easy. As you're looking to continually improve, make it easy for people to do the right thing. Have you ever walked up to a door with a big gripping handle and seen a sign that says push? Fortunately, I've already checked the doors here, we're okay. But I have seen that. I have pulled handles that you have to push. Make it easy to do the right thing. If you want people to push, take the handle off. <laughs> it works. And believe it or not, you can do the same thing in other activities. I had a boss once who couldn't type. So I somehow quickly thought, if I want an answer, I want short and sweet, two or three mouse taps, right? Click, click, yes or no. So I position my emails as such. Would it be da 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 da, yes or no? All he had to do was two or three clicks. Make it easy. The way I like to look at make it easy is what's natural. What is natural in the process flow? Some people call this the voice of the customer. If you are accepting information or people are coming to you for something, the best thing you can do is get in their shoes. What we did at Pfizer was I would send my staff out to be in the position of the person asking for what we provided. It did a couple of things too. It helped them realize that we cared about them and it helped my staff understand what was important to our customers. Magical things happen when we realized how to our customers some of these things were just so strange. There are organizations now that have huge customer satisfaction surveys in place I am a wonderful person to always answer those. Tell people what's wrong. Help them make it better. You're doing them a favor. I reframed complaints to my staff. I made little signs, kind of like bumper stickers, and I said, complaints are gifts, though you may not like how they're wrapped. <laughs> because otherwise, you just hear these things as complaints. And really, your customers or whoever is kind of telling you how you can make your process better. Don't take it personally, you can make it better. And then the last thing that has always worked well for me is to just take action. 
You know how they say if you have to do something, you have to eat two frogs, eat the ugliest one first? You just have to do things. With the situation in the medical community, we tried to take the emotion out of it, but we stepped up. We, we made our list of ideas. We knocked on doors. Some of the groups we worked with actually had continuous improvement experts or departments that were willing to listen to us. Have you ever been to your doctor's office and had to fill out three separate forms that have 80% of the same information on each form? Of course, if your doctor's a kind of a relationship person, when you go in, the doctor just talks to you anyhow. They don't look at the form. Would you be out of your comfort zone if you suggested that maybe while you're waiting, you could identify the duplications so that the next time they updated that form, maybe they could make a, a correction? Would that make you feel bad? Would you suggest that you could make them a PDF fillable form, they could email you before you came? <laughs> <laughs> then they could read your writing. And you would have it done and maybe you wouldn't have to wait so long. I love to do that, PDF fillable forms. I mean, it's not that hard, make it easy. Do something. I moved to a condo area and one of my nieces was coming to see me. So I gave her directions. This is before she had GPS on her phone, whatever. So I, I live one mile east of Sprinkle Road on H Avenue. Didn't know the change took place, but this magic corner of H Avenue and Sprinkle Road, where I, in fact, got my only ticket of my life because I was in a severe car accident, had a wonderful new sign that said E space H Avenue. They had put the direction E. Now, if you're from Kalamazoo, you know we have a lot of two-digit cities or roads, right? CD. Yeah, well, guess what? It goes all the way out to VW, right? Well, being from Grand Rapids, my niece didn't know that. So she clearly went through G Avenue, which didn't have an E, whizzed right by EH, on and on, and finally got to my house anyhow by some retracking. Now, I learned from that because the next person that I would tell how to get to my home, I certainly would explain the flaws in that sign. And I'm sure my niece would not do this wrong the next time. However, you know, we all have this need to serve, right? It's one of our foundational things, to provide service to the next person. I thought, you know what, I bet I could make that better. So I called the road commission and I, I said, I noticed you've got a new lovely sign, it's lighted up at night. However, it's E space H. Every other lot, sign down that whole road and the streets before don't have the directions. Would it be possible to change that sign and just say H Avenue? Well, that would be very expensive. I was so committed, I said I would be willing to pay. <laughs> well, he didn't have an answer for that because no one, <laughs> who would do that? You know, this continuous improvement, it kind of gets in you. Let me see what I can do, he said. So I called back in a couple of months because nothing had happened. And he said, oh yeah, you're the sign lady. I said, yeah, mm -hmm, okay. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I, I, I still see it's, it hasn't changed or anything. And I gave him a couple of suggestions. Make it easy for him to do what I wanted. Let me see what I can do. About a week later, I went by and there I saw E period H <laughs> Avenue. <coughs> he had painted a dot. <coughs> <laughs> I was so excited. I called my friend. She wasn't home, I left a message. Judy, Judy, I got my period on H Avenue. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Her husband said, honey, I think this one's for you. And my last quick story, if I may, because continuous improvement does work, is at work, we had done this nice project, this wonderful proposal. We had packaged it up. We knew we had a good thing. And since I'm kind of the leader of the group, 
I was going to go to important person number one and get permission. Important person number one said, you know, that's a, that's a good idea. I like that idea, but I'm not going to give you the big hammer because I've got bigger fish to fry. So I went to important person number two, you know, pick a person. Important person number two was busy or whatever. By the time I got to important person number three, my balloon was starting to fizzle. And I did what any intellectual woman of my age would do. I called my mother. <laughs> and my mother said, you know, Penny, if no one's in charge, I guess you are. If no one's in charge, I guess you are. Do you mean I could make that change? I did. You have more power than you know. Small changes are powerful. We're all on a journey in our personal and professional life. I suggest to you that continuous improvement is research-based, practical, and kind of a fun way to approach life. And in case you didn't catch it, the acronym I gave you was TED. <laughs> Think, easy, do. All right, we're finished with our first TED Talk. And um, <laughs> I, like I said, a little bit homespun, home but intentionally that way. A lot of times we see these things and they're very, they seem a little out of reach. And we chose this one because this is, just, this is within reach. Um, in, in the segment, you heard terms like process mapping, Kaizen, voice of customer, value. We're going to talk a little bit about each of those things. Um, I also just have to duly note her example around the Roads Commission. And to me, the, uh, the fact that, again, so frequently we, we don't have that perspective of what is, what is the, the view from the customer's experience. And that's going to be a really critical component of introducing um, this work. Um, here at the county. So with that, we're going to get in, into, again, some, some uh, three slides that are around sort of core lean principles, concepts, um, and uh, uh, techniques. We're not going to go into depth, but just to give you guys a, a fast overview of the material. Um, this is really both lean is both a mindset and a tool set, and that's why uh, we've tried to sort of focus it the, this way. First and foremost, um, this work is about an investment in people, and again, recognizing that our employees who do the work are the experts in these processes, and really engaging them in reconsideration of, of our processes every day. So five key principles we'd like to share are, are, are on the slide here. The first being critical is setting goals and challenging the status quo. That doesn't mean the status quo is wrong, but just to take the time to reflect and examine each step and why we would choose to continue or change steps in our processes and how we, how we approach our work. Um, second principle, this is that element of conti or continuous. Everything can be improved. That doesn't mean that the, our processes today are broken. It just means we can do better. The third principle is around fixing root causes. Lots of times we jump to solutions. We think we know the better way without doing the analysis to really understand the problems in front of us and what are the root causes. Critical, critical principle of this approach um, to work is respecting others and seeking understanding. That's both from a, a customer perspective, perspective, from an employee perspective, from a manager perspective. Taking that time to communicate is critical. And again, this teamwork approach, that it's not uh, top-down, it is much more organic and involve, involving the folks who do the work. Next are some key lean concepts. You've heard it uh, a little bit ad nauseum at this point, but the perspective of customer is a really cr critical element of continuous process improvement. And frequently, particularly in a public sector setting, that can be that conversation in itself can be a challenging one, the, the term customer. Because sometimes uh, the folks we deliver services to, they don't have another choice. So this is going to be a really um, interesting aspect of the introduction of this set of tools and, and um, 
principles is how do you define customer in various processes? They can be internal customers, they can be external customers, but that will be a key element of the work. Um, the other a aspect is this question of value. Of each step in a process, how does it actually create value from a customer perspective? And there's a lot of different tools to get at these questions in a methodical and disciplined way. A third area of, is around this question of waste within processes. On your uh, slide here, it does talk about the eight different types of waste. And as we do process flow and process mapping, you will we'll be analyzing the time between activities and whether there's waste that can be eliminated. And this is one of the tool sets you use for that. Uh, the next slide is really, this is, this is quite tangible tools and techniques for doing this work. It's not just ideas. Um, one of the cr core ideas here is this PDSA or PDCA uh, cycle. Plan, do, study, act, or and sometimes it's referred to plan, do, check, act. Um, the idea here is, again, you, the starting, what is your starting point, starting point? Assessing the status quo, understanding how the system is working, and then starting to set goals um, to, of where you want to change, implementing those changes, reviewing how well you did, and starting the cycle over. It is really um, fundamental to any of the continuous process work. I'll just highlight a couple more. Um, Kaizen events. It is really a scalable improvement uh, intervention with a series of specific tools and methods that you can use, um, and we'll be talking about those as part of our first year rollout. Uh, the other aspects that are probably important to focus on are things like A3. A3 is another problem solving, um, solving template that we expect to be using, and process walks. Literally, this is getting out and seeing how things work, not just sort of being what you kind of remember it to be, but actually in the workplace watching how things work. Uh, one of the Japanese terms for it is going to Gemba, and it, uh, there's a strong uh, recommendation for managers and leaders to go to the floor and see how things work. So now we're going to actually do another short video, and Eric's going to do his AV magic to show sort of how Kaizen thinking um, can be applied in very straightforward ways. And that process is emptying the dishwasher. Now then, let's take a look at the current before Kaizen process. Notice that our operator, who I might add is extremely experienced unloading dishes, first fumbles around as she picks up the silverware. She then takes around six steps, which equates to around 12 feet in order to reach the drawer with the silverware tray. She then places the silverware into the tray as we see here. After this, she turns around and repeats the process until she's placed the last piece of silverware into the drawer. Now let's watch the rest of this process take place. Now then, when the team analyzed this process, they learned that it took a total of 1 minute and 25 seconds to unload the silverware and that our operator took a total of 30 steps covering approximately 60 feet. This was then used as their before Kaizen baseline performance. Now with this data captured, it was time for our kitchen Kaizen team to make some improvements. Now the first thing the team focused on was how to reduce the trouble the operator experienced when picking up the silverware, as well as placing it into the drawer. Well, after some discussion, the team decided to practice the straighten aspect of 5S. Specifically, they decided to change the way the dishwasher was loaded. Well, in the original process, the silverware loading operator simply placed the silverware anywhere in the holder since no one had ever asked them to do it in another way. Unfortunately, this only led to problems for the unloading operator. 
So a small change was made whereby all the spoons were loaded beside each other, as were all the other forks and the knives. Now, this change didn't create any extra work for the loading team, but the unloading operator felt this change would definitely help her. The next problem the team focused on was the amount of walking the operator was forced to do. Well, the first idea the team came up with was to simply move the silverware tray to a closer drawer. This would immediately reduce the amount of walking required by more than half. Additionally, one of the younger Kaizen team members came up with an additional idea no one else had thought of. How about we just take the chair and put it over there? What do you mean? idea was to simply pick the holder up, carry it to the drawer, and then unload the silverware instead of taking separate trips back and forth. Now the other Kaizen team members were excited to give this a try, which was exactly what they did next. Now as you see here, the operator now picks up the silverware holder carries it a few feet to the drawer and commences to unload the silverware as we see here. Obviously, nearly all the walking has been eliminated and while there's still an opportunity to improve the handling of the silverware, this new process is much better. In fact, this new process using the same amount of silverware only took 38 seconds and the total distance walk was less than six feet. Well, when we compare the metrics, we see that the total time to unload the silverware went from 1 minute and 25 seconds down to 38 seconds, an improvement of 47 seconds. And the total distance walk per day was reduced by 54 feet or 3.72 miles per year. So, in just a short time, our kitchen Kaizen team has been able to radically reduce the time it takes to unload silverware from a dishwasher. Again, a little bit of a silly example, but I think there's some value in looking at something that's um, neutral and not specific to what we do to see how these techniques work. One thing I just want to draw attention to here is the use of data. That part of this approach is to measure our processes and, co and measure it when we make changes. So um, in our broader work plan around uh, doing performance measurement, there's an, there's an um, ability within doing continuous process, impr process improvement to have our workforce be getting, working, strengthening that performance measure, measurement muscle we all have by very simple techniques like measuring process flow. So with that, we're gonna actually get into CPI or our PRIMO program here um, in County of Santa Cruz. Um, on the screen is a list of the steering committee members uh, that joined uh, Eric, myself, and Rita this summer to pull together the program. And I wanna acknowledge their, their work and contribution over the summer to um, develop these ideas. And of course, you're not official until you have a steering committee, so it was important that we had one. Um, the coming out of the summer, the, the program sort of vis vision and mission is really, again, coming back to this building a culture of employee-driven, customer-oriented improvement. That vision is to value people and where the people there are, pe are both our employees and our customers to improve the way government works. And again, coming back to that this is a culture, it's a mindset and a tool set focused on customers, driven by employees, with measurable approaches um, to improvement. So the steering committee, as you can see, like you can see from the membership, really had a mix of, of department leaders who were, have been here and have a long history with the county, as well as new faces such as myself and other folks. And while some of this seems pretty straightforward, this is really a change management initiative and being conscientious about how you're gonna introduce this was something that the committee spent um, some time talking about. First and foremost, um, continuous process improvement is not new to this county. And so we wanted to be uh, to honor that this is something many departments in this county have been doing for quite some time. And that the goal then is to develop um, shared methods, language, approaches and resources, so we really are doing it in a, in a countywide manner as opposed to a siloed approach. 
the second sort of core um, objective and concern was to recognize that there's a full range of experiences, some very formal with internal resources in place, some where it's been more ad hoc and, and really on just um, as people thought of new and uh, interesting changes. And accordingly, the program tries to address that ver variety and experience uh, with a different, different kinds of training to, to bring everyone to some common ground. And the last concern area was the question of balancing the introduction of this program um, with all the other uh, work we're doing to improve performance countywide. So as you, we roll out this first year, you'll see we've t in t been intentionally um, mindful of the impact and how to do this in a way where it's resourced and we can, s we can learn from the experience in this first year and then scale appropriately. So of course, how do you uh, build this results-oriented risk-taking culture? Well, one step at a time. Uh, so we really have three, uh, three strategies within the program. First is the demonstration projects, which is you start doing it, you practice. Now to do that, you need to share info about the mindset and tool set, and we'll ha we have a three-prong uh, training program that we'll be outlining. And then really, again, sticking to our values of making it transparent and accessible and collaborative, having a broad communication platform um, to share information. I do want to spend a moment talking about the risk-taking component of this work. Well, it's easy to describe CPI as con controlled experimentation. Sometimes the, the interventions you take will not go as far as you thought or may not work at all. And one of the things we have to do as a culture is be um, accepting and uh, reflective on mistakes and learn from them and, and promote conversation about learning when things didn't work out as you planned or if they did work out as you planned. So that's one thing we want to be able to focus on is we are going to be encouraging folks to take more risks and what does that then mean in terms of our culture of, of leadership and support. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the demonstration strand of the program. There are, we sort of have arrayed these as four different types from fairly straight, I would say very straightforward to highly complex. And I'll start on the right side of the screen. Really, the, we call those these just do it's. And the, the expectation is with a little bit of exposure to lean ideas and concepts, folks can, and one of the ideas is 5S, which is about how you clean up your workplace. Um, folks can just take initiative on their own and, and make small improvements in their daily work. The next one is our, or what we're aiming for is 12 of them, is 12 bursts. These are typically, they can be f processes that might involve, you know, four to six people, not highly complex, but pr pretty well known and standardized. And then taking an afternoon to map it and quickly identify are there um, steps that you can um, increase the value of or eliminate, it, eliminate it, um, entirely. An example of that right now would be within the CAO's office, we have tried to stabilize and standardize our internal process for managing all the forms that Carlos had to sign and whether it made sense for him to sign them or someone else. Not a super extensive visible process, but something that was taking resources within our office. Uh, the next step up is true Kaizen events. These are gonna be more considerably more complex business processes, uh, larger groups of people, and typically you take a three to five day deep examination of the process, uh, where you want to go with it, and start identifying improvement opportunities. And then the final bucket, which we are um, highlighting one focus for the uh, program in this first year, is a, a highly complex Kaizen project. This has a check mark because we've identified that project, and I'll speak to that in a moment. These are gonna be the most complex, interdepartmental, lots of folks involved processes, and typically they may uh, require multiple Kaizen events to actually uh, s focus in on uh, opportunities for improvement. We'll talk a little bit about this, this next project. Um, I wanna first give a shout out to uh, Kathy Malloy, Matt Machado, John Ricker and Dr. Leff, because they are the, the brave set of leaders who have offered a, a process for this, um, our main uh, focus for the program, our most complex uh, focus for the program, which is around really looking at our permitting processes. 
as you all know, multiple departments, uh, a lot going on. Um, and part of this is building on the continuous improvement work that these departments have already engaged in. Uh, they've already had management review groups to try and understand barriers and get things where things get stuck, moving from paper to their e-plan system, and things like extending hours for so there's more time to work face-to-face -face with customers. We really appreciate that they're willing to go uh, to this next level and, again, using the employees that do the work as the key drivers of this, this effort, um, use some lean tools to um, dig into our processes and understand opportunities for improvement. We expect this is going to go on you know, through the entire fiscal year. Um, we are starting to plan for this work, uh, work to identify consultant support to do a, a significant facilitation documentation of our processes, and from there we'll articulate specific opportunities for improvement. But I really want to um, uh, just laud the, the, this team for stepping forward with such a public-facing process um, and being willing to, to try these new techniques. Moving on to the uh, strategy around training and capacity building, as we've mentioned, uh, the steering committee wanted to do this in a way that um, was both intentional and thoughtful, uh, but also accessible to many. Uh, Lean really depends on a, an active, dynamic partnership between management and employees to do this work. And one of the things about that is supervisors and managers um, really taking a different role when it comes to process improvement and come moving more towards coaching, selecting proje projects, giving some guidance, and then letting go. This might be some new behaviors for some of our managers and leaders, so we acknowledge that um, learning about this and, and learning how you do it is one of the uh, training sessions we need to do. And then there's more that, that ap actual practitioner um, the practitioner training, the folks who are going to be doing these uh, improvements, learning how to map processes, and, and we're asking that we have departments identify SMEs, subject matter experts, who will be working with uh, throughout the year to first have that kind of training and then uh, apply it. The training modules are all about you, you identify projects you're going to work on with these ideas. Um, so you actually, have, you're, you're able to really move from just concept to, to practice. And then the third bucket here is what we call our self-serve self material. We want to make it, the, whether it's videos or small practices or templates, available to any uh, staff member for them to try in their own work. So it, we want this to be a very um, democratic, egalitarian uh, program where anyone can access it, even if they're not one of the sponsored programs in the, or sponsored projects in the first year. So from that, we'll move more to communication. And again, while we want this to be managed and a sub in a way that we can be effective, given the resources we have, we also want to make it available and um, to all all members of the county community in terms of understanding the culture we're striving for. And there's really two components to that. Um, we Pretty much it can't be a program without a website, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But as we were going through the steering committee process, um, one of our members, who's sitting over there, Edith, had the great um, idea of how do you make the communication a little bit more accessible, a little bit more organic, a little bit more natural. And the idea is we will be working with our department heads on a monthly basis with bite-sized pieces and concepts about lean. So they can then share through their staff meetings and then sort of cascade it through their organization, these ideas. It's not like they necessarily have to jump to implement, but that we make it a more natural conversation about different ideas of doing work. So that's our active sort of cascading uh, communication strategy. And then, of course, as I said, you can't be a program without a website. So we will also be having a website platform. We'll start small with a focus on training and getting people involved and supporting the sponsored projects. But our goal is to really make it be a vital hub where people can get resources, um, learn about what's going on, build community of communities of practice and learners uh, to really make this a place where everyone can see the transparency and the collaboration that this type of approach um, affords us. 
So I'm not gonna go through this slide. This does give you uh, the year at a glance, um, and I can promise you these things will change. And our intention here is to have, we're benchmarking ourselves to say when we plan to do things, um, when we need to change things, because it doesn't fit with how projects are getting rolled out. And I'm happy to answer questions about these, but it does give you that year at a glance to uh, hold me accountable for where we're going. So that was a lot of information. Um, a lot is going on. Very quickly, we've asked departments to identify their, their leaders and liaisons that are gonna be participating in our first round of training. Start thinking about the processes they would like to be working on. And then we're gonna start doing some of those departmental conversations about these core concepts. We need to build our program administration. You, this, this is a complex machine we're trying to construct and we'll have the official kickoff in mid-November as some of these things come into play. Um, if there's anything I want all of you to take away is again, for all the focus on um, continuous process improvement on efficiency, and you can get efficiency gains from this, it really at its heart is around people and, and our customers and our employees and engaging them authentically in this work. Um, and then the, the idea of building a culture based on service and improvement and, and measuring what we do and not being, and actually embracing those numbers, not being afraid of those. And with that, I just wanna see if Carlos wants to add anything or I can move towards questions. Thank you, Ms. Benson. I'll never look at my dishwasher the same way. Um, <laughs> are there questions from uh, board members on this? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I'm, just really happy to see us uh, taking this uh, as a follow-up to our strategic <coughs> plan implementation and all. And I think it's not unlike what we did a couple of years ago on a fiscal sense when we said we want to build up our reserves, we want to increase our bond rating and so forth. And we had a real target and we met it. And this is uh, something I'm really happy to see happen. And I'm especially happy to see, uh, it looks like a beginning point with the uh, public in the public facing process with the public works, environmental health and planning department, probably anything that we hear complaints about service, and it isn't because we don't have good employees, but is the coordinated effort that is needed to get people to understand the planning process, what time is it gonna, how much time is it gonna take, and probably how, in essence how much it'll cost me. So I think that's a great starting point to focus on and I'm really happy to see us do this, and I think it's a, a really great, succinct uh, presentation that you've had. Um, I think it's something that the public will enjoy, and I think our employees are gonna enjoy it as well. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation, and thank for the thoughtfulness of uh, putting together uh, all these different pieces. Uh, it's, um, I'm not a management expert, um, but I like the idea of doing work that engages our employees to help us figure out how we improve uh, the delivery of services to the community. Um, and the big Kaizen, um, I don't remember what you call it, uh, event of, the, of looking at our permitting process is something that the public really cares about um, and I'm sure all my colleagues hear about regularly um, in trying to figure out how to make that process work better. Um, so I look forward uh, to, to how that moves along, and I've had conversations with both uh, Matt Machado and Kathy Malloy uh, about that already, and I think that they're taking some, some good steps. So I look forward to the engagement with the other employees, and at some point, trying to take a look at it from the public. Uh, uh, recently, a uh, retired planning department employee who has gone into the uh, private sector um, uh, I saw him and he said, you should just have our, our department heads try to get a permit and uh, they'll see the, the challenges that, that are faced there. So um, I like the part about trying to see this from the perspective of the customer uh, because I think it will yield some really good information. I was curious um, about the other sort of uh, slightly less complicated but more Kaizen events. What might that what might we be looking at in, in those kind of events? Have you had any conversation about that? During the steering committee process, definitely the leaders around the room started identifying processes within their own departments. But our, our 
process will actually be, um, we're gonna do some training uh, with, with leaders and middle managers to give them um, some skills in identifying processes. We're trying to get that planned for a little bit later in October. I was gonna say next month, but it would be this month. Um, and then really we're gonna ask for nominations. Uh, everything has been on the table from, I wanna look at either if we talked about some out of state travel, travel in general. Travel in general. Um, we've had people talk about things like our performance evaluation systems. Uh, we've had pe all different kinds of processes. I'm hoping it gets, um, there's a little bit of energy and enthusiasm and we have a lot of nominations, too many for us to be able to support centrally, um, but so we'll have to see. I, th it is asking folks to be brave and to put processes up there for evaluation and examination that they may have been, you know, have a lot of ownership and original creation responsibility for. So the, the big thing with this is not making it about the people, but really making it about the process. Um, th I think that's helpful, and so I'm kind of curious about the, about where the nominations come from, and um, and is it just going to be uh, department heads or managers, or are we going to ask line staff to also be part of suggesting things that could go better? Our expectation is that leaders will be will be taking. Um, I would say a bottoms up approach as well and working within their operational staffs to understand where are their pain points. You know, what, and I would rather, like I said, have many lists um, from, from bottom to top and top to bottom than sort of just here's the three. Absolutely we would expect that there will be conversations with ground level, folks on the ground doing the work because that's really where the process improvement work will live. Right. I mean, because uh, in the in the steering committee and all, all the charts, I I, uh, uh, I was you know wondering to see where the uh, 2,400 staff members. That's a very uh, um, very cogent observation. One of the ideas that we've talked about in the steering committee, um, at the outset, we felt having department level leadership to sort of start thinking about change management was important. But we've all acknowledged that as this program. Um, matures, really that steering committee has to be a much more cross-sectional representation of the workforce. It really does not need to be as we had, I'll just say it, Eric had a great um, term, which you will notice this was predominantly a female steering committee. We need more worker bees and less queen bees. Um, that we need to have the experience of people doing the work. They do the work and they're gonna be doing the improvement. So one of our goals is to, to morph that committee to a more representative committee over time. Sure, and, and, and I think you know, we have employee organizations who could nominate people the, uh, for consideration about that to represent a, sure. a wide range of needs. I think it's worthwhile to check in with those constituent organizations. The last part I had is what will the public see or how does the public participate in all this? Well, I would say first and foremost, to the extent that we're focusing on public facing processes, it does come back to the question of voice of customer and the perspective of customer. And that is gonna be um, part of the design work for the examination of specific processes that we need to pay close attention to and not substitute our, our thinking of what their experience is with what their direct experience is. And that is one of the reasons why we are working to build sort of a roster of lean facilitation consultants. Um, we need folks who are not, um, don't have their own history with the process to help us ask some of those harder questions and whether it's through focus groups and asking customers about their experience, whether it's through surveys, there's a variety of different tools we can use, but we absolutely need to appreciate and include a customer perspective in this work. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, one thing, the uh, Soquel Creek Water District, uh, in, t in terms of talking about their water situation and solutions, uh, uh, began holding a series of public meetings and they, um, made a great move where they had a private well owner who also have to be a facilitator help co-chair meetings. And I think it, it developed buy-in um, from community members knowing that it wasn't just the water district or the water district staff trying to talk about these issues, but 
uh, other people who are affected by their issues. So trying to figure out how to, to give voice to that um, will be important. And I don't, I don't offer uh, um, a particular way to do it, but I think it's something you want to keep in mind throughout the entire process. I look forward to seeing how this uh, rolls out and the kind of projects we pick with uh, uh, these other Kaizen events and the other Burst events. Yes. Uh, the, maybe we'll hear about those uh, and some updates sooner than the other ones. Uh, but I think just getting people to start thinking about how to do things better here in the county and recognizing that um, the old way doesn't have to be bad in order to do it better in the future is, uh, is, is pretty healthy. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you uh, very much. It's, uh, it's good to see uh, we do work, uh, we're public servants and we, we have to respond to uh, the taxpayers and uh, time management uh, was shown very clearly there uh, how important it is to get back to, uh, as they refer to the customer, or we could put the name uh, taxpayer, the people we work, work for, uh, not the other way around. They don't work for us, we work for them. But um, I think that's a key element uh, that we get back. We actually communicate with people and we're actually uh, telling them what we can do and what we can't do. So I, uh, I like this. I, keep, I think it keeps us focused and uh, I want to thank you again uh, for your report. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you. I'm really excited about this. Having read about the Peak Academy in Denver and other places, I think there's a there's a lot of opportunity. And it, and it, you know, when we're asking our staff to do more and more and more, uh, we have to figure out how to do things better um, so that we can provide good service and not have our um, staff, you know, burning out and trying to to juggle too many balls at the same time. Uh, so I really appreciate that it's bottom up. Um, a couple observations uh, and customer oriented, that's incredibly important. A couple observations is one is we really wanna make sure we're outside the silos, both within the county, but also externally. So the extent that we're contracting with partners, um, from their perspective, it's all the same service or it's all meeting the same needs. So we don't want to just sort of fix things within the four walls of this building, but also other government agencies or, or community partners that we're contracting with, make sure uh, that experience is, is um, integrated as much as possible. And the last piece is, and this is really essential for I think the board, for you to hear from the board, which is that um, we need, you uh, and we are willing to assume some risk, right? Our travel policy, because 40 years ago somebody did the wrong thing, now we've wasted 15 minutes of people's times, dozens of times a year for 40 years. Um, and so uh, in order to prevent one small bad thing, uh, a black swan event from happening. Um, and so if you're gonna make changes in process, and what it means is that we're saving time or customer experience and that there may be, that there's a certain level of risk that the managers and the, gov and the elected officials are willing to assume uh, because we're gonna get a better process improvement. Um, you know, there's, uh, I know small businesses that, you know, they used to check IDs on every check, but that takes three minutes um, for the 0.01% of checks that are bad. It's a, it's a way better trade-off to accept some risk and then, uh, and in order to, to save everybody time in that process. Um, so making sure that, that, that we have, that we're willing to build risk into that, into our systems, uh, if it's, especially if it's something that's taking an inordinate amount of time or causing people uh, a lot of pain, uh, for, for what is a, only protecting us from a one-time event. Appreciate that. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, briefly, I'll just uh, add on my appreciation. A significant amount of work has already uh, gone into this, which was evident. And uh, you had made a comment, Ms. Benson, I'm just gonna kind of paraphrase, but that uh, many people that come to the county for services don't have another choice. And I think it's an important thing for us to constantly remember because in our lives, um, in this country for that matter, we're, we have a lot of choices and a lot of things we do. And, and so people will, in essence, vote with their pocketbooks or their feet in a different way. And they don't have that opportunity in, in a number of government services. And we have to recognize um, that either on a, uh, if, it a, if it's a 
life necessity issue, such as in the human services or health services component, or if it's just a basic service issue, such as in public works or in uh, planning, per se, uh, people don't have a, there's no other option. And so we have to recognize that that also will lead to additional scrutiny in a way that wouldn't occur if somebody had another option, and uh, the degree that we recognize that is important. Uh, the last component is uh, there's sort of a lot of uh, inside terms and inside components to this, and uh, the distillation that you have on the key takeaways is important, uh, not just for the board and for the community, but for the staff, uh, to the degree that we just sort of move away, I think, from uh, that and just to what we're trying to do here is just make things better for the community is really what we need to get to. And I, I think that what happens is, is that people hear these things and they kind of tune it out as uh, consultant speak, and we have to be careful about that. Uh, so I know that's not our, our intention, but uh, it, it, uh, there was a lot of it that was um, that I think people will see is that way. So w I think the message the, to, the, to the employees are, you know how to do the job better, so let's just do it better. And uh, we're, we're ha in a pretty significant new era at the county of trying to do a lot of process improvement, and not just with the budget component, not just the way we do core and the way we fund programs, the way that uh, Supervisor Coonerty has led uh, a lot of performance metrics, but in basically everything we're doing is a new day. And I think that it's important that uh, people feel empowered to bring a, us across the finish line on that new day, maybe without some of the terms, you know. Uh, so I'll open it up now for the community and it's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on item six. Thank you for waiting. Good morning and thanks for waiting. Good morning. So Olivia Martinez from SEIU. So I have a couple con concerns. Um, one is I think that the CEO should have called us and let us know about this program first. Second, um, your presentation I have it bothered me a little bit, especially your Kaizen example. It kind of dummy down our county workers. And because I'm the union rep, I'm the voice of the workers, right? Deming is interesting, and I think you guys should take a couple steps back because Deming goes to Japan after the Japan War, right? Where we had some involvement in that, right? And MacArthur tells him to go, right? Instead of doing his management style here in the US, I wonder why he didn't start here in the US and started in Japan. His, so, his model is based on production line and manufacturing, right? He's taking math, right? St statistical math, and he's marrying it with human variations. And that's a problem because the county is not a production line nor is it a manufacturing, right? And so I'm wondering how you're taking the human aspects of variation into this account. So that's my biggest concern about that. The other is that if we look at Japan and if he was so successful here, Japan is the second highest suicide rate, right? So what are we doing here? What is it that we're moving into? What kind of model are we moving into? I actually like the little girl taking her time as a, mo as a mom. I'm like, yay, she's taking all the time in the world. <laughs> she's figuring it out. The other thing is that Deming's model takes away the creativity, right? And so you're taking that part of the creativity out. So there's a lot of things that I think I'm concerned about and also how does this impact labor relations in a different way. Um, this is not a new concept in terms of customer service. HSD has led the way in many different aspects around customer service. So I'm not sure what you're trying to do this. What I propose is actually having a conversation with SEIU about this model in terms of impact because really the issue here is that after the recession, right, or during the recession there was a lot of layoffs and there's a need for more workers. That's the issue here. And our, our members are doing an incredible job with very little. How do you bring this Deming program into CPS, Child Protective Services? How do you bring this model into the variations of child safety and everything? And that's a thing that you have to consider also. Um, you know, in one of the, in Deming's model, he talks about, right, that the workers, just one second. Briefly, thank you. That the workers, stop production line in order to see the problem. We've been asking to do this for years and years and years. 
and management hasn't necessarily always listened to the workers. So my proposing is that you guys sit down with us, with labor, and talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us? We are not your customers. We pay your salaries as citizens that expect you to work in the public interest. Your question, Supervisor Leopold, of where, where is the public in this? We already have a recent example of streamlining with the, what you've done with the consent agenda to streamline the public out of the process so that people really don't have an opportunity to speak on the consent agenda as we did before. And I'll make a note that it was Becky Steinbrunner, who really studies these agendas, and me, who we are most consistent critics of what you are doing and trying to give you direction. When you brought forth Carlos Palacio's model for streamlining these meetings with the consent agenda, with Ryan Coonerty and Bruce McPherson on the agenda, is to be noted that no member of the public participated in that process. Streamlining. I think it means streamlining the public out of the process for the benefit of moneyed and corporate interests. Those you talk about setting priorities. Those are the priorities I've seen over and over again, especially with wireless technology. About a month ago, you um, passed a resolution in opposition to Senate bill, I forget the number, you wrote it, uh, Supervisor Leopold, to um, streamlining a wireless uh, broadband infrastructure and uh, small cell deployment where counties and cities have absolutely no rights of where these dangerous radiation emitting facilities are going to go and they're proliferating. You just spent about an hour on this presentation, which I also consider demeaning to the workers. Dr. Carl Merritt has offered to speak on the health impacts of wireless radiation. He should have an hour here on this serious public health issue. This, I, I, I'm appalled at this presentation. Anybody else like to address us on this item specifically? Okay, we'll see none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'll move approval. I guess I just want to comment um, on the, I think there is absolutely outreach that needs to be done to the, to the folks on the line level. Um, it's really important that they're the ones that can drive change. They know the work the best. Uh, and, um, but I also think that when I was hired here as a supervisor and I filled out the same information 18 times on my personnel form with pen, that is an enormous waste of my time, <coughs> staff time, and if we can move to an electronic system instead of walking, watching paper being walked around this building, um, every dollar that we save on, on uh, paperwork is a dollar we can spend on public health, it's a dollar we can spend on at-risk youth, it's a dollar we can spend in other areas. It's just not, this is, there's no budget reductions we're talking about here, we're talking about making sure that we're taking the public's dollars and the, and the, the very precious time of our workers and spending it in the best way possible and we have to look at processes um, if we're gonna do that and we have to make sure that we're driving towards outcomes that are beneficial to the 
consumer and to the people who use our services rather than sort of processes that were put in place to check boxes um, or for other bureaucratic reasons. Um, uh, this is about empowering people to be able to make human decisions on the front lines unencumbered from unnecessary processes that are wasting, uh, that are wasting resources that could be better allocated to people in need. Um, so with that, I'll move the recommended act. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you for your work. We'll move on to item seven, which is to consider the final appointment of Candace Elliott to the Workforce Development Board as a representative of local business for a term to expire June 30th of 2022. We received the nomination, or was accepted on September 18th of 2018. We have the memo. I move this approval. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Anybody from the community like to address us on this appointment? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to item eight. We do have a 1045 scheduled item, but I think we can get this item in. Uh, item eight is to consider report and presentation of aggregate data for 2018 quarters one and two of the whole person care cruise to health pilot and direct the health services agency to return no later then November 20th, 2018, with the next update as outlined in the memo of the Interim Director of Health Services. Good morning and welcome. Good Thank morning. you for waiting. Good, or, good morning, honorable members of the board. Thank you for having us here this morning <clears throat> to present on our aggregate data from quarters one and two of the 2018 Whole Person Care Cruise to Health updates. My name is Emily Chung. I am the program director for Whole Person Care Cruise to Health. I was hired in February and I'm very um, happy to be here and present for the first time. I have with me um, Jennifer Bailey, one of our Whole Person Care case managers who will be presenting in a moment uh, briefly about one of our client success stories. So I'd like to, I'm guessing I just hit the button. Can you use the arrows on the keyboard? Keyboard. Yeah. All right, I can do that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so as a quick refresher, Whole Person Care is one of, we are one of 26 pilots in the state <coughs> to test and innovate new services that are not currently billed to Medi-Cal. So the state's program started in 2016, so we are in the state's program year three. However, we were funded in July of 2017, so we are only 15 months into the program, so we are still launching, starting up, and getting services ramped and going. Our funding goes through 2020, the end of 2020, as, um, and the funds are 50% local match as well as 50% federal financial, financial share. The focus here in our county is to integrate our behavioral health and medical services to support some of our most vulnerable and complex clients. It's very timely that we follow the presentation around continuous improvement um, and the PRIMO project because our central focus is to innovate and use PDSA cycles in order to develop the um, best outcomes for our clients as well as the process outcomes to help develop the uh, data sharing infrastructure, the care coordination infrastructure that will be most useful to streamlining our work in order to develop the right services for these uh, complex clients. So we are tracking um, over 17 variant and universal metrics for the state and we are currently doing seven Plan Do Study Act cycles at this time, all towards these goals of improved client um, outcomes and um, better integration of care. Our population is unique to our pilot in this county and we are working with our adult Medi-Cal beneficiaries who are assigned a primary care provider at our health service agency clinics. They must have a behavioral health and or substance use diagnosis as well as at least two of the other conditions listed on the right. So we're looking at homelessness, multiple chronic conditions and uh, hospitalizations. This is a quick snapshot of the geographical distribution of the clients we have enrolled in the uh, population of our enrollees. This is as of June 30th when our data for the state was um, the ending of our submission of our data to the report for the mid-year. So all assignees are assigned to one of our PCPs and most are um, show residents of Santa Cruz with about 20% showing residents of Watsonville. 
We want to provide some data about our enrollees. You can see here that um, substance use disorders are uh, impact the majority of our enrollees. Now this bar graph does reflect um, clients who um, have multiple diagnoses, so a, a one enrollee may appear more than once in this bar graph. So we, um, all of the enrollees have a behavioral health diagnosis, whether mild to moderate or especially mental health, uh, or sorry, um, seriously mentally ill. Our Clients' um, medical conditions are very complex, and again, many have multiple chronic conditions and appear multiple times in this bar graph. We know, so, we know smoking is linked to multiple chronic conditions as well, so we are looking at um, interventions that we'll be adding to our services that will address smoking cessation, and um, in a moment I'll talk a little bit about a, a very innovative technology program that we're providing to address many of these chronic conditions. So I want to turn the mic over to Jennifer Bailey for just a moment to give a quick client success story. Um, she is one of our whole person care managers hired through the um, funding from the state, and we are very happy to have added case management as one of our services for our integrated behavioral health clients here in this county. Hi, thanks for having me. I, I don't think your microphone's on. Alrighty. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes and talk to you about a client. His name is Robert and how a combination of his participation in our services has really supported him to have some positive outcomes. So I met Robert um, back in April, right before he was referred for our services. Um, he was living, he was homeless, he's about 53 years old and he had suffered a stroke. Uh, about seven years ago. So he was in a wheelchair and he did not have um, movement on the left side of his body. When he was referred to us, he had been hospitalized. He had recently just been attacked on the streets and not only were his belongings stolen, but also his wheelchair was also stolen from him. So as you can imagine, Robert was very um, medically you know, vulnerable and very fragile emotionally. So when I met Robert for the first time in April when he was referred to us, I asked him, Robert, what are your needs? What, are, what do you vision for yourself? And the very first thing that Robert said to me is he said, you know what, Jennifer? He's like, I just wanna feel safe. I need, I need to have a roof over my head. And tears started to come down his, his eyes from his face and started to cry. And I said, okay, we can work on that. I said, what else? What else are your needs? And he goes, I need, I wanna build physical strength. He goes, I'm in this wheelchair, but I know that I can still walk if I had the right supports. And I said, okay, we'll work on that too. So one of the first things that we did for in whole person care was we immediately referred him to our housing navigation services. As well, we also referred him to peer support with the hope that we could find him stable um, housing, if not temporary, but eventually permanent, and that we would be working on getting him a DMV voucher in time. The next set of services that we provided was that we coordinated a conference, a, a care conference. With that, we invited medical professionals and we utilized Robert's words and his input from what his needs were to create a shared action care plan and that would involve creating the next action steps and who was going to be in charge of following those through to support Robert with meeting his needs, okay? A lot of the work that I did as his case manager was making sure that his multiple needs, medical needs and their mental health needs were being met and being a good advocate in the clinic and being able to coordinate a lot of those appointments to make sure that his needs were being met because he had a lot of complex needs. Um, as a result, about six months later, uh, Robert now is going to all of his medical appointments, which is a huge success. He is um, participating in weekly therapy. He's also going to our week weekly IIMR class, which is a wellness group. It's for individuals who have medical issues as well as mental health needs. And they sit there and they communicate and they talk about how to lead a happier life and take charge of the symptoms and the, the things that they are going through and experiencing. In addition, um, at the end, Robert says to me about two weeks ago, he said, you know what, Jennifer? He goes, I, I like where I'm at right now. He's got stable housing, which, is, uh, which has allowed him to stabilize in all the other areas of his life, his medical issues, 
Um, he goes, I'm starting to feel like I rec I'm recognized out there. It's not so scary anymore. So Robert, in the end, what I gathered from that is he's starting to build self-esteem, a sense of worth, self-worth. And at the end of the day, like that's really, really important as he continues to stabilize and he takes more charge of his own life. Okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Really appreciate that story. And um, his story does highlight many of the services and innovations that we are testing here with whole person care, as well as the need for um, appropriate housing for our complex clients, for additional um, support network for these clients. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about what some of these services look like. Um, but as I mentioned, homelessness is a big issue. Um, Robert started as homeless and we're still working on stabilizing his housing, but with the, um, almost half of our clients uh, in whole person care reporting homeless status. This does not include those who are at risk or whose reporting information is not completely accurate. So we know that this number may not represent our full extent of homelessness in our enrollees. So whole person care is built around stabilizing housing as well as the innovative behavioral and medical health services. I'd like to give you a quick update on some of the services we are providing um, to date and what we're about to launch. So we have um, in the past quarters one and two, we have launched and ramped up services like the um, health and wellness classes that Jennifer mentioned, the integrated illness management recovery. We've launched peer support coaches and we have um, additional <clears throat> behavioral health support uh, staff as well as now have, we have the housing assistance and tenancy support dollars, which I'll talk about in our next slide. We're very excited that this fall we'll be piloting our um, data exchange, our data integration platform, which is a partnership with the Santa Cruz Health Information Organization, our HIE for the county. This new platform will be a care coordination referral management application that our case managers, um, our uh, housing navigators, peer support coaches, and other providers will be able to use over the coming months. We'll also be launching our telefriend devices, which I had uh, alluded to earlier. These telefriend devices are remote uh, monitoring devices to support integrated behavioral health and medical disease management and monitoring. So individuals who are diagnosed with, for instance, COPD and uh, schizoaffective disorder would get daily content sent to these devices that will be assigned to them to help them uh, manage, monitor, and understand their own diagnoses as well as then um, for allow us to be more proactive as they input their own um, data about how they're doing each day. So we're very excited to be piloting that later this year. I'd like to highlight some of our um, new services that have be, are being provided for the first time through whole person care in this county. And those are um, housing navigation services where 56 enrollees as of June were um, receiving housing navigation or had received it. 20 enrollees had received housing assistance, which comes in the form of deposits and or first month's rent. These um, 20 individuals, 18 were identified as homeless when we enrolled them, two we uh, believe were at risk for homelessness, and so we've been able to help them um, stably uh, get housed by providing that initial um, set of costs to get into housing. And we are also providing peer support coaches, and those peer support coaches are helping keep clients stable and help them manage their uh, wellness uh, through appointments and um, things around the ho house sometimes. Um, these services are part of a contract with Front Street Incorporated. They're one of our many contract providers and stakeholders, so we're really happy to have that relationship with them. Enrollees who are not housed yet continue to get housing navigation and are working through things like getting SSI benefits, housing vouchers, and also um, being supported in getting their smart path assessments as part of coordinated entry. These last few slides are just some, some data slides just to give you a sense of the demographics of our um, enrollees. And you can see that the older adult population is one of our most vulnerable complex populations and matches very much with uh, who we intended to reach. The um, MHA MHSA Innovations Grant is part of Whole Person Care and that target was our older adult populations who are getting specially mental health. 
We can see here in the um, gender slide that most of our enrollees are male, which indicates to us that perhaps we need to um, target our uh, engagement and activities for our clients who identify as male. That might mean tailoring certain activities and services. And again, that's part of what we need to learn. That's part of the PDSA cycle, where we'll test and see what, uh, how do we better engage with our male population that make up the most of our enrollees. This slide with the race and ethnicity of our enrollees um, lines up generally with our county population. Um, we definitely uh, feel like we can do more outreach to our Hispanic Latino population um, by, uh, we are actually looking to hire a bilingual case manager as well, so we hope to be doing some additional work there. I'd like to take a moment to thank our many partners and stakeholders who've been a part of the whole person care process since the very beginning. Without them, we wouldn't be able to um, do what we're doing today. Uh, these individuals and partners continue to uh, participate through our advisory council, various work groups, and doing shared client care. And um, as an example that Jennifer mentioned, we have shared case conferencing. We are doing more along those lines to help with the infrastructure around how we coordinate care in a more streamlined, effective manner. So we thank them for their participation. Finally, I'd like to just mention a few of our next steps over the next few months and ongoing throughout the project. Our target is to reach 1,000 unduplicated clients by the end of December 2020. This does not mean 1,000 at any given moment. We are not built out for that capacity. However, with um, client success as they uh, graduate and disenroll for other reasons, we, will, um, we believe we will reach that 1,000 unduplicated clients by the end of 2020. We'll be applying the learnings we are taking from the PDSA cycles and hoping to use those to improve and expand some of our most utilized and um, popular services. We also will be spending a lot of time focusing on enhancements around our innovations around data sharing and care coordination so we can leave an infrastructure in place regardless of what happens after 2020 when this funding opportunity is over. So the infrastructure is a really big part of where whole person care will be leaving, um, in, leaving the county at the end of this. But we are still very early on. We're only 15 months in, so we have a lot more to accomplish over the next couple of years. I'd like to acknowledge our whole person care team. Uh, we have uh, Robert Gomez and Kelly DeBain who uh, worked on much of the data. They're sitting in the audience. And Brenda Zeller who's back at the office. And of course with Jennifer and our other case managers. And um, I look forward to any of your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and both of your outstanding work. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for the presentation. You know, uh, we talk about this program a lot because we get asked a, a lot of questions mm -hmm. uh, about it. And I was um, very happy to, uh, I was kind of surprised when I read this about all the housing support that is part of it. Because my understanding, at least what I thought was my understanding, is that this grant did not pay for uh, housing support. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we have housing navigators, uh, that, we, that we can provide that tenancy support, it, it seems to me to be critical. Uh, especially since our overall strategy is a housing first strategy of moving people in. Has that changed or did I misunderstand when we first got the grant? So you're right that the, um, the funds from Whole Person Care may not go uh, pay for ongoing rent or housing for any of our um, county uh, population. However, the state and um, the federal, uh, the feds recognize that housing is critical to health that housing stability is a part of how do we look at a whole person. So under that whole person care approach, our housing support services, including the navigators, the deposits, and tenancy supports, are helping stabilize our clients so that they can then work on their um, maintaining and uh, empowering themselves for better health care. Great. Well, I'm really happy to see that because I think it's a really critical part and I'm glad we're being able to leverage the, the dollars that we get to get, move people into housing. Absolutely. Um, in your slide around uh, PDSA, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there was a there was a circle that said promote community tenure, and I was trying to figure out what that meant. Sure, uh, promoting community tenure means um, keeping people living in independent housing in the community versus being institutionalized or hospitalized for any reason. So we really want to support individuals living at the um, 
lowest level of care that they can sustain successfully. Got it. Okay. Understand that now. The, the, I didn't see a lot in your slides about substance use disorder treatment services. Um, you talked about the integrated... Um, Illness management recovery? Yes. You said it. Um, <laughs> that seemed to be, you know, be some kind of support groups. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also thought I understood that this part was for people with co-occurring um, diagnoses. So um, fill me in about what we're doing in terms of uh, substance use disorder treatment services. Sure. Um, substance use disorder treatment services continue to be provided through our um, substance use disorder services in the drug Medi-Cal waiver. And uh, we are working with our um, substance use disorder teams to ensure that care coordination is happening. We're not providing additional substance use treatment. Um, that would be outside of the scope of whole person care. But it is critical to be doing the coordination work around how how we um, ensure people are being discharged from substance use treatment and getting into the next level of care, whether it's uh, finding housing or it's uh, maintaining their appointments and ongoing support. Great. Um, you mentioned the report points out that 318 people have been able to access these services, and I understand they, don't, they may not stay with the services all along, but with an end date of December 2020, it's a lot of people to get to a thousand, mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering: are there is it going to be increased outreach, mm -hmm. or how will that be done? Because it mm -hmm. seems like December 2020 for that amount of people, given what's going on so far, seems like a big jump. Mm -hmm. We certainly have a lot of work to do in terms of determining um, at what point to disenroll and graduate individuals um, stepping down services. But we um, are still ramping up some of the services. Some of the services we've had some fluctuation with staffing. So we expect to be able to touch more lives. Um, I believe that will be one of our major um, process improvements is uh, streamlining how we enroll, disenroll, and continue uh, people's success by getting them into a lower level of service. Yeah, well, we hear a lot about the need uh, to provide effective mental health services or behavioral health services mm -hmm. for those in the community. And so when I, when, when I talk about the whole person care and say that we're going to be able to um, address the needs of 1,000 people, that goes a long way. And I just want to make sure we, we get to all 1,000. Yeah, we'll certainly uh, update you on the progress of that number. <laughs> yeah. um, just a, a few other questions. Sure. When you showed the partners in this, that's a very uh, distinguished group, but I didn't see the safety net clinics as, as part of that. I'm not sure whether that's part of HIP, or it seems to me that some of these folks are, are clients of the safety net clinics mm -hmm. or could be clients of the mm -hmm. safety net clinic. Right. Um, yes, you're right that HIP is representing the safety net clinics in some ways for whole person care. Due to the way that our funding was um, designed in this application, um, we are working only with clients who are um, assigned a primary care provider in one of our health service agency clinics. So if they are assigned to a safety net clinic outside of that, they wouldn't be a part of whole person care. However, we are partnering with them to learn more about the populations and learn about how we can do better around care coordination infrastructure and, and then moving towards a better data sharing model. So at this time, we are not including safety net clinic clients. Well, so help me figure it out, because mm -hmm. when, uh, when the expansion of Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. uh, people were assigned mm -hmm. to different clinics. Um, and if you were assigned to Salute Paro La Gente, mm -hmm. but could access these services, are you, can, ac can you access them, or do you need to be transferred to the county clinic? If it was appropriate for a client based on the care team's decision, a client could transfer to one of our clinics to receive the rest of the whole person care um, services. But at this time, we are not set up to have um, the safety net clinic clients assigned in whole person care. Yeah, well, I, I think that, that that's limiting, and I, I just want to make sure that we're reaching out to all those folks, too, because mm -hmm. um, the, the, one of the last questions I have here is, you know, we, we redesigned the, what we now call the HOPES program, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I imagine that, that there will be people who uh, receive outreach through the HOPES program which are appropriate for whole person care. Um, and if that, but it may be a homeless person, it may be someone else um, who may be affiliated with one of these other safety net clinics. So I'm just, uh, it seems to me that we would want these pieces to link up um, mm -hmm. and, and make sure that we're leveraging all the different pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if one of the 
HOPE's staff identifies someone, what happens then? Mm -hmm. We are working with HOPES as well. We're learning, we're working better together. Um, we would work with a HOPES referred client who uh, is eligible for whole person care. We would check their eligibility based on our uh, requirements um, and enroll them if eligible. If they were not, then we would definitely work with HOPES to figure out if there's, if they want to transfer to our clinics to then be eligible, we can do that. Um, but if they are doing better with the clinic they've been assigned to, then we would support um, trying to find what services are, are available for them. Um, so they wouldn't be officially then part of the whole person care. Until but they, they transferred PCPs, yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate that they, that you know, they're, they're, our primary, our patient-centered care model mm -hmm. um, would have to be broken in, in, mm -hmm. in order to receive those services. So. I certainly think it's an area worth looking into about expanding our scope if, um, if and when possible. I think we have, um, as part of the state's guidance, we are to be testing and innovating. So if we're finding that reaching only our um, health service agency clients is too limiting, we can consider that, and that's something we can uh, keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, the last thing I'll just add, when it comes time to make a motion, I'm going to suggest that our chair write a letter uh, to the mayor of uh, the city of Santa Cruz uh, to share this information because to me this represents some uh, progress uh, uh, for dealing with issues that we have, uh, we are told by members of the community is critically important mm -hmm. and which are uh, another jurisdiction, at least uh, uh, the city, I think uh, other cities have told us too, are, is uh, critically important. And I think it's helpful for us to share this information uh, about what's going on and provide an opportunity to answer questions because um, this is, is helping tr to try to make a difference in our community and I appreciate that and I appreciate the thoughtfulness you did putting this together and sharing this information with us. Thank, thank you. you. Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, thank you. This is such an important program uh, and I have, I have a number of questions that I think I sent to your office and I haven't gotten a response back yet but hopefully either now or after this presentation you can give it. But I guess to start is on the numbers. So this was as of June 30th, we had 318. Where are we at today? We are a little over that, like 330-ish. I'd have to double check. It, it changes pretty regularly. <laughs> okay. Because um, I think, you know, if we're going to hit this 1,000, mm -hmm. it seems like we're going to have to increase um, pretty dramatically. Some of the outcomes I get we want to have people being entered in the system. We want to have them getting housing navigation, but that's not really an outcome. That's a that's a means to an end, right? That we're looking for people's lives. So, in terms of outcomes, uh, some of the things I'm interested in is uh, have ER visits for the population decreased among enrollees. We received your questions this morning, and I apologize okay. for not having the answer to you. Um, we can do an analysis looking at our. Um, data from 2017 that we reported in our mid-year, so we can have that analysis and re, um, share that with the board um, in the next few days. Sure, and so with these updates, I mean, this is both now and then as an ongoing, yes, I'm interested that. in, mm -hmm. yeah, reduction of ER visits. How many enroll, enrollees have enrolled in substance abuse treatment and how many are still uh, ex experiencing sobriety six months after their treatment? Mm -hmm. um, That's yeah. a difficult question to answer um, due to some of the, uh, the segregating of the substance use data but we can um, do a re request for a report from our uh, IT department on that yeah, as well. Yeah, it seems mm -hmm. as though yeah. mm -hmm. we could track them across yeah. the different systems. Mm -hmm. um, only 12% of the enrollees have a criminal justice history. Um, many, many of these folks, I think, that the community is talking to us about are the, these high-impact folks uh, who I assume would have more of a criminal justice history. Um, what are we doing to reach out to that, to the very high impact people who are likely in and out of our jails uh, as well as other services? Mm -hmm. We are partnering with the probation department and have a probation officer um, within the most team at Special Mental Health. We certainly feel there is more room to outreach and engage with um, those who are uh, justice involved, and that could happen at the point of just of um, being uh, released. But I think there are many opportunities for us to reach out more, and I, and those numbers may be even be uh, uh, misrepresenting and uh, undercounting actually. So okay. I think we can investigate that a little bit more. And well, and I think there's opportunities to partner with Hope and yes. PACT. There's mm -hmm. also opportunities, assuming Measure G passes, uh, to have them 
to have this program integrate with the crisis intervention team mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because those that'll be the highest impact people. Mm -hmm. um, with 56 people uh, getting into housing navigation, uh, how many of them are finding housing? Because mm -hmm. the nav being navigated is great, but but it doesn't really matter unless you have a roof or you had like our like Robert. Yeah. Uh, so so what what are we finding there? And if and if there's a limited supply of housing, what's the solution to help people find housing if if there's just none available? Mm -hmm. Our housing navigators are doing a fantastic job. Um, they are going to meetings with the clients to meet with the landlords to make sure these are appropriate housing opportunities. But you're right, the housing stock is certainly uh, an ongoing issue for this population as well as our entire community. Um, of the at the time of the report of June 30, uh, 56 had or were receiving housing navigation, and of those, I think it's around 20, so the 20 we mentioned had found some sort of housing, and um, that leaves many people that still need housing. So part of the solutions are to uh, ensure they have ongoing um, rent, um, so SSI benefits or vouchers. The housing stock in itself, I think our, we're going to be needing to test ourselves and our navigators to be more creative about solutions. Um, we've, I've been hearing more and more from um, statewide partners around um, shared housing models, about roommate matching programs. I think we need to be thinking a little bit differently in terms of what, um, what opportunities are for housing, as well as leveraging the opportunities that will be coming um, in 2019 from some additional California funding. Um, so. We don't have the solution, but I think we want to look right. at some testing some new ideas as well. And of the 20 who have found housing, can you describe, I mean, how stable is that housing? Mm -hmm. Of the of the 20 we've been successful with, is this is this one month housing or is this you know hopefully more permanent housing? Mm -hmm. We certainly have had a couple of those 20 um, not find that those housing situations were the best fit. So they continue to get nav navigation. Um, but most are have been successfully and stably housed for at least a, a couple months or more. Um, our housing navigation started earlier this year. So we're still, we'll learn more over the next few months and hopefully in our next report we'll be able to tell you a little more about those we did house and give you a comparison of how many did not succeed in that situation and how many did. Um, but we're finding places where they, uh, it's a good fit. I think that's why our navigators are so vital is because they're spending time with the clients and the landlords to make sure it is the right fit before investing that time and money. And are we having people avail themselves of the Homeward Bound program or other opportunities to find communities where maybe the housing is more available or less expensive um, and then helping them transfer their their medical uh, histories and support systems to those places? Mm -hmm. We have not connected with the Homeward Bound program, but I will definitely add that to my list of um, areas to explore for us. Okay, yeah. and I think, you know, I think it would be, the idea would be not to just get folks onto a bus, but mm -hmm. to actually make sure, help them transition, help yeah. them make sure they're assigned to a local clinic and, and are making, you know, and have the support system, but maybe in places where there's housing available today instead mm -hmm. of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Right, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Uh, one question, uh, the, the age factor, the, it was 53% that were 50 or older. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how that compares exactly offhand with the population of the whole county. Was that surprising to you or, and, and or could we uh, anticipate with this going from 330 or to 1,000, is that, as the percentages, do you anticipate that holding or is there any way to gauge that? It would be difficult to gauge, but I wouldn't say that our initial uh, enrollee population being um, majority over 50 is that surprising um, given the the scope of our target, having multiple chronic conditions, um, having multiple medications. Um, we um, And we also, um, given that whole person care is a, uh, has embedded in it the MHSA Innovations Grant, which targets older adults, it makes sense that we're targeting um, that population group. However, to your point that as we want to expand to the thousand, I anticipate that we'd want to move more upstream and try to target younger uh, populations as well to reduce um, their likelihood to become our high utilizers and um, suffering from chronic conditions. So I would hope that that number would, um, our percent of uh, the age group would lower a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
I, I know one thing, uh, when we do have housing being built, uh, people put their name like on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of them would uh, appreciate more personal, actual uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times they feel like they're lost. Uh, they don't know where their status is, mm -hmm. whether or not uh, their application has actually been you know, received and put on a, on a list. So uh, when somebody calls, are they just referred back to the computer? Maybe they, a lot of them don't have a computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm getting at. So is the telephone conversation personal? Are they able to actually talk to somebody mm -hmm. and then get some kind of answer? The reason why it's so important is if somebody puts all their eggs in one basket, mm -hmm. right? Uh, hoping to get this uh, affordable housing, mm -hmm. and if they don't get it, they don't have a plan B. So if we have some kind of communication, they can maybe be forewarned that they should be applying for somewhere, somewhere else also. Sure. So in regards to our housing navigation services, our housing navigators work directly with the clients. They do in-person, face-to-face -face communication with the clients as much as possible to support these complex issues around wait lists and applications and um, making sure they're eligible for everything. So our navigators <coughs> and our case managers are working very closely with clients to make sure all avenues are open to these individuals, whether it's through the coordinated entry system and the smart path assessments or other types of housing like subsidized housing where there are wait lists. So we're keeping all avenues open for them. And it is very personal and in person, if not um, on a pretty regular basis, yeah. Sure, and, and I guess uh, with the new mental health uh, clinic going in in Watsonville, mm -hmm. uh, how important is that to the uh, finding housing and all that? Uh, because there, there's a relationship there, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Having additional services and um, parity in the South County for our clients is going to be very important to make sure they're tied into the um, behavioral health services that they need to help them with their housing stability. Sure. So um, we're really excited for that to open up and our um, we'll have case manager assigned down in um, South County working with those clients and partnering with the special mental health teams. Right, and that uh, I think the opening is just about a month away. Or I think so, in November. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're excited for it. Uh, uh, it's exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open it up for the community. Anybody like to address us on this item? Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Supervisors. Mimi Hall, Health Services Agency Interim <laughs> Director. I just wanted to acknowledge the hard work of our whole person care team and, um, and all of the staff and the partners that they've been working with. I hope that the report that Emily Chung has provided today has um, been enlightening and informative. One of the things that I want to um, kind of reiterate is that the purpose of these 26 pilot projects across California is to help inform the state do these tests, do, we hypothesize that when we wrap care around people and we put housing first, um, that people are going to have better opportunities to improve their health care outcomes. So not only are we serving Santa Cruz County, but the point of us being funded is to help inform the state of California as they figure out what they're going to do in the future with um, how they um, how they build the infrastructure of Medi-Cal covered services. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note out, I know Emily talked about it during her presentation, but um, this is actually, we're just a couple of months into year two of our grant, even though this is the state year three of the program, it's very confusing how they name it. We just finished our first year, we have two more years. So we hope that we uh, enroll between 300 and 350 people in each of our program years, and when we follow that trajectory, we should be reaching our 1,000 person goal by year three. Many of the first months of our first year of the program were spent ramping up the program, trying to hire staff, um, developing the relationships with the partners, and I just wanted to commend Emily and her team for their excellent work. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your work, too. Thank you, Mimi. And if I could add um, to her comment about where the state is heading with the information that they'll gather from the whole person care pilots across the state, um, this is a very um, important time for all of the communities to be providing that level of um, data and input and guidance to what the state will be attempting to fund in Medi-Cal in the future so we can have more integrated care coordination and um, seamless services for our populations and I've been lucky to sit on a state advisory council um, advisory committee right now around care coordination and are, I'm trying to bring some of these learnings back to the state at that high level and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Uh, thank you for your work. Um, you're looking at homelessness and mental health, and um, I have this. It says it's related, of course, underlying relationship to what's going on. Feeling sad and depressed? Are you anxious, worried about the future? Feeling isolated and alone? You might be suffering from capitalism. Symptoms include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of powerlessness, fear, apathy, boredom, cultural decay, loss of identity, and the list goes on. And in this capitalist system, over half our tax dollars goes to the military wars, and so, to have money left over from the tiny pieces of pie after that theft of our tax dollars to provide for people in the community is almost impossible. I'm feeling that until we solve the, solve the problem of the corporatocracy and capitalism we live in, uh, we're going to be having more and more problems. Now, you talked about monitoring devices on people. I spoke to you earlier before the presentation about the harm of radiation, microwave radiation devices. And I'm going to add to the record a few documents here because when you talk about whole person care, what is affecting the whole person? And we are all in this um, being shrouded, I say, in microwave radiation. And I don't think you have, ladies have seen this. This is a detector of microwave radiation. It's way up in here. And these are the, pol the um, frequencies indicated by sound that we're exposed to on this acousticom two meter. So I'm really, uh, disturbed that you plan to have these monitoring devices on people which are actually biologically damaging. So here's what I'm submitting for the record that I know you're coming back no later than November 20th. I want you to include the 5G appeal of scientists and health professionals calling for um, moratorium on the 5G rollout. Can I read the rest of the list or just submit it? Just submit for the record. Please. Okay. Would anybody else like to Very address this Very serious item? health impacts. Thank you. All right. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I would move uh, the recommended actions of accepting and filing this report and, and uh, direct them to come back on November 20th, no later than November 20th, with an update. Uh, Supervisor Leopold, you wanted a, a letter? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And also direct the chair to write a letter to uh, the mayor of the city of Santa Cruz updating him about the progress we made on whole person care. Second. We have a motion and a second. Thank you for your presentation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. The board will take a five minute break uh, to allow the next presenters to be able to set up. So we'll be back at about 1115 for the next presentation.
welcome you back to the Board of Supervisors. And we have our uh, slightly delayed here scheduled item, which is item nine, is the presentation of the Oral Health Access Santa Cruz County 2018 report card as outlined in the memo of the chair. And just as by way of brief introduction, some of you may remember uh, we had a 2016 oral health needs assessment that Dientes had commissioned, but many in the county helped participate on. And while it was the first in Santa Cruz County's history, it was actually one of the first in the state to really take a full look at oral health needs throughout our community. And as a result of uh, that analysis, uh, there were some actionable objectives that were taken and uh, the steering committee has maintained of, of local health and community leaders to try and implement some of these recommendations. We're here to receive an update with our 2018 report card from the Chief Dental Officer for Dentists, Dr. Sep Seppi Tagbai. Seppi, thanks for being back. Thanks for co-chairing this with me and for all the work that you do for the underserved in our community. Uh, many do not realize how hard it is for our health access within Santa Cruz County. And Dentists is not just a safety net clinic, it's a primary care clinic for those that need uh, dental care for many in our community. So thank you for your work as a Chief Dental Officer and we look forward to your report. Thank you, Zach. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I was here about a year and a half ago to um, tell you about the report, the findings and our plans to address the needs in our county. And I'm um, here, as Zach said, to give you an update on what, what we've been able to accomplish so far. Um, so it all started back in 2016, as Zach said, we um, did an oral health needs assessment in Santa Cruz County and we found that the need for access to affordable, high quality dental care in our community is tremendous. Um, from the report, we saw that out of 80,000 patients in our county on Medi-Cal, only 25,000 were able to access a dentist in that year. And this was in 2016, mostly because private practitioners are not willing to take Medi-Cal or Dentical. The fees are extremely low. And the two health clinics, um, Salud para la Gente and Dientes, we were at full capacity. Um, also out of our children under the age of 11, 30% had never been to the de dentist. That's horrible because you're supposed to go by the time you're one or by the time you have your first tooth. Um, seniors on Medicare have no coverage for dental and 17.6% um, of adults on Med Medi-Cal um, only receive dental care. That's really bad because everybody on Dental or Medi-Cal has coverage. They have full dental benefits. It's just a matter of finding a provider that's willing to accept Dental. So we took out the recommendations that came with the needs assessment. There were 12 that were included and we decided to narrow them down and focus on areas that could have the highest impact, impact and also focus on prevention for children. So from that, our three goals from our strategic plan were shaped. Firstly, we decided to do a first tooth, first birthday campaign to educate the public and providers about the importance of um, dental visits at an early age. Secondly, making kindergarten or first grade dental visits mandatory in Santa Cruz County schools, and also expanding treatment, prevention, and clinical capacity in our county. Um, and the bottom line is we're making a lot of progress, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm actually really proud to say that we started this work before Prop 56 passed. So we did the needs assessment, we had a plan in place, and we were gonna implement our plan even without the funds. We were gonna find the funds somehow. But when Prop 56 passed, uh, the tobacco tax, we were lucky enough to have the funding that we needed to support our plan. In addition, for the, um, in addition to the funding um, to support the plan, the health services agency made me left, but now they have dedicated oral health staff to staff members that are completely um, only working on oral health. So it's, it's a big step. The other counties, I went to an um, oral health meeting in Oakland and all the other counties are scrambling, trying to come up, now that, that there's funding, they're trying to do a needs assessment, come up with a plan, so we're ahead of the game. Um, so as far as our progress with our first goal, the first tooth, first birthday campaign, we have done two phases. The first phase, we sent educational information to 106,000 Medi-Cal recipients through partnering up with the Alliance. 
Also, we send educational information to over 2,000 healthcare providers because some medical or even dental providers are not aware that you're supposed to take your child to the dentist at when they're one. Um, we also partner up, partnered up with First Five to include um, information about oral health, these very cute little flyers, and all the new baby, um, baby gateway packets. And every newborn in our county, regardless of income, gets one of those packets. And now it has very, um, very accurate information about oral health. As a result of um, these efforts, uh, the utilization rate has increased by 3%. And that's in 2016. The funny thing about the data that we're reporting on is that the data we have to get from the state, and they're really behind in giving us data. So this year, in July of this year, they, will, they were finally able to give us data from 2016. So we don't have 2017 data yet, but I'm hoping that we are getting closer to our goal of 60% for 2020. We're also in the second phase of this campaign. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard on the radio, but we have little um, educational material about your child doesn't come with a training manual, but they do come with reminders. So when you see that first tooth in their mouth, you gotta take them to the dentist. So um, I heard that on the radio on my way to work one day and I was super excited. Um, we're also doing something called geofencing. Um, which means if, if a new mom is going to an OBGYN office and she's looking at her Facebook, uh, the phone realizes that she's at an OBGYN office and it automatically gives her like a little ad on Facebook about first tooth, first birthday campaign that if she clicks on it, then it takes her to a landing page that says here's why oral health matters, this is what you need to do, education, prevention, and also a list of providers that take Medi-Cal. So I thought that was pretty cool. The second goal was to reinstate kindergarten oral health visits. Um, we partnered up with Santa Cruz Office of Education and I'm really happy to say that we were able to include dental visit forms in all the enrollment packets. So 3,500 um, students, whether kindergarten or first grade, got those little forms that they had to go to a dentist and get that filled out and get a cleaning and a fluoride treatment and an exam before they could enter school. And um, remember when I said 30% of our kids in 2014 had never gone to a dentist? That dropped by 50% to 15% in 2017. So that's amazing. And then lastly, we wanted to increase treatment, prevention, and clinical capacity. Um, we were able to do that, Dientes and Salud together, we have grown our visits by 30% and our patients by 17%. At Dientes, we're at full clinical capacity, so the way we've been able to do that is by increasing our outreach program. So our outreach program is a mobile van that literally takes equipment and then you take it to the cafeteria in a school and you set up and then you go get the kids from from their class and you do prevention, you do x-rays, you do education, you do a cleaning and a fluoride treatment. So that's how we've been able to increase our visits at Salud para la Gente. And they do have the physical capacity, but they didn't have enough providers. And they've been able to incorporate mid-level providers in dentistry in their clinics. And that's how they've been able to grow their visits. In addition to these two, um, ways of increasing capacity, we've also looked at some innovative ways so that we could incorporate more dental prevention into medical visits. So for example, we have been, I've been working with uh, Karen Jones from CHDP and we've been training medical providers and medical staff about how to apply fluoride varnish when a child comes for a medical visit for an annual checkup. And um, on this slide it says 64, but by now it's over 100. Um, providers and staff that have been trained and as a result the number of children who are getting fluoride varnish at a medical setting has increased by, by 270 percent. So like I said we have a million dollars from Prop 56. I never thought I would be excited about people smoking but um, it, it's great to have this funding to make our plans happen and um, I wanted to thank all of you. I remember when I was here 
a year and a half ago, I think it was Zach that said, so what do you need us to do? And I said, just remember oral health, like when we come to you and we ask for clinic space or we ask for funding, just remember that oral health matters. It encompasses every aspect of people's lives. Um, and you've really been there for us, whether by being on the committee or supporting our new clinic on Capitola Road. I'm very, very grateful. And um, I'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, any questions from board members? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your ongoing work, advocacy, um, and sharing this information with us and with the public about uh, what we can do to, to achieve these goals and improve oral health for so many families here in Santa Cruz County. Um, uh, it was, uh, uh, I feel uh, grateful to be able to support the expansion of services in Live Oak. Um, and to see this number, about 7,000 additional patients by mm -hmm. 2020 with that new 10,000 square foot clinic um, is very exciting and uh, it's gonna m make a great impact in the community and you know, uh, for a clinic that's gonna be in walking distance to every single mm -hmm. school in, uh, in the Live Oak um, uh, will mean that uh, you'll see lots of uh, patients, lots of families and has a great opportunity to be an integral part of uh, the community life. Um, in, in looking at the numbers that you had about uh, the Medi-Cal utilization rates uh, for young children, um, I'm wondering if you're noticing anything at the clinic uh, with the uh, continued assault um, from the uh, federal administration about how, uh, uh, about anybody um, who has a questionable immigration status or might even be a legal immigrant who's accessing um, uh, uh, programs like Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. um, the recent change in definition of what a public charge is uh, seems to me, uh, the, the reports I've seen is it means that less people will be accessing services that they need and are legally entitled to mm -hmm. because of this new change. Have you seen this in the clinics yet? I can't say that we've seen it, but I can say that we have done our our part because we knew that this would be a factor for our patients. So we've gone, we've really done a lot to try to um, face that obstacle. For example, we made signs for all of our clinics that says that we're a sanctuary space and we have policies and procedures for our staff to follow in case um, that becomes an issue with um, if anything happens that can, you know, our patients may be involved. And we've also had educational material that we have been passing out to our patients about their rights and how they're um, um, you know, entitled to these services and how it's important for them to continue to access these services. Yeah, well I think your report has uh, shown and, um, that uh, early access to uh, uh, oral health services will improve the lives mm -hmm. of, uh, of those children for the rest of their life. And the, the callous attempt by the Trump administration to demonize even legal immigrants yes. in this country is, is, uh, is, uh, works against our public health mission uh, to try to ensure that people ac can access these services. Uh, I appreciate your, your ongoing work to help make this happen. I'm, I'm glad that we get these regular updates and uh, I look forward uh, to your next presentation when we have moved the needle even more. Even more, so. thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, this is a tremendous program. It's, I guess it could be described as a life altering work at, uh, at an early age, uh, healthcare mm -hmm. at an early age. Um, I'd just like to somehow, if we haven't done this, thank those dentists who are participating. And if they could have an individual letter from this board <coughs> saying, you're much appreciated, this is, you know, the results. They probably know this, I, I'm sure, with your report. But I'd, I'd just really like to have them step up because it's not every one of them that's doing that. And mm -hmm. uh, I think I think it'd just be really nice to give them a note of appreciation. I can work with dentists and on behalf of the board send a letter thanking those that are taking this population. Thank you, that's a great idea. Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you uh, for being here and uh, thank you for your report. I'm all for uh, access uh, for children to get the health care that they might need. Um, with the Salud Para La Gente and then the Dientes and then we have the dental clinic in uh, Watsonville mm -hmm. on Freedom Boulevard. Uh, 
how, how, are these three different programs or are they kind of working together? Uh, we're working very closely together. So the dental clinic in Watsonville, that's a part of Dientes. Right. That's um, um, a contract with the health services agency in Watsonville. So that's run by Dientes. Salud para la gente is a separate clinic and they have their own dental program. But we work very closely. You bet. And uh, the only problem I have with uh, the presentation, I. There's a lot of good, uh, you know, access and and everything. The word mandatory, mm -hmm. mandatory uh, before. Uh, to, what are they going to kick them out of school in no. kindergarten? No. Well, I should maybe put an asterisk after the mandatory because there is a waiver that the the parents can refuse to to bring the child to the dentist, but most people don't. We're not going to. That's not the goal. The goal is to have that paper just as a reminder and get them to go. Um, and we've done our part at Dientes and also at Salud para la Gente. For example, if a parent calls and says, I need to get this form signed so that my kid can go to school, we fit them in. We make exceptions for them. We fit them into our schedule. We make sure that they have the access that they need. We also, our outreach program, we go out to schools and we do, um, as I said, education and prevention and x-rays and cleaning. So we also go out to the schools to try to support that. <laughs> and I've, I've seen this happen before. I, I, again, uh, yeah, there's a waiver. We saw a waiver before with uh, vaccinations mm -hmm. and uh, then that waiver was eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, I, I, I guess what I'm getting at here, I'm all for access, but again, the word mandatory and signing a waiver is mm -hmm. the next step. Yeah. The waiver is not going to be any good. And then uh, what I want is I want kids to go to school. I want the parents. Yeah. Parents are very uh, involved with their kids and they take care of them. And uh, I'm a little afraid of uh, the state having the word mandatory and the state requiring certain things. Yeah, it's just like the, uh, f on my presentation, and maybe I should change it, it says mandatory. On the actual form, it does not say mandatory. It says dental, dental screening form. Mm -hmm. And it has a section where you fill out the child's name and information, and it has a section um, about like if they have any dental decay or not, where the dentist fills out that section. And then at the end, it has, I cannot, take my child to a dentist, there's a check mark and there's a reason that you can put down. And there's also at the bottom, we added information for Dientes and Salud, our phone numbers and our addresses so that they can have an avenue of access. Um, the, yeah, the goal isn't to, the goal is to have it be a reminder. And it's not, this is a law that was mandatory by the state a few years ago and they took it back because the funding was taken taken away but we decided that we wanted to continue to implement that in our county okay. but it's definitely not mandatory oh, okay. and it's very easy to waive it and we are not going to take that waiver away I promise we'll keep it on the floor oh, I, I, ho I hope so <clears throat> and then the other would be uh, fluoride uh, varnish mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of uh, fluoride uh, I think when they get older, maybe that's uh, something that would be very good. I know it, it uh, prevents a lot of cavities and all that. But we're talking about fluoride va uh, varnish for uh, zero to five, <coughs> uh, from zero to five. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have a problem with that one. Uh, were they going to do fluoride varnishing on a, a five-month-old? If the five-month-old has a tooth, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fluoride yeah. is the only two evidence-based practices in dentistry that have proven to be completely safe and completely effective are fluoride varnish and dental sealants on the molars. Um, there has been no reports of toxicity or adverse effects of you know, problems with fluoride varnish because fluoride varnish is topical. We're not talking about a pill that they take. We're not talking about drops that they ingest. It's something that's very sticky. It's topical. It sticks to the teeth and that's how it operates. It becomes a part of the tooth um, complex and it makes the tooth much, much stronger. And fluoride has been shown to reduce rates of decay by 40%. So because we don't have fluoride in our water, and that's a whole 
different topic that I won't get right. into today. Fluoride varnish is a really good way to prevent decay. It's completely safe and I can present you with thousands of articles about the scientific yes. basis for my argument. I, again, we're talking about very young children. Mm. And, uh, 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 is that part of the mandatory uh, waiver? No, that's a whole separate program where the child is going to um, a well child checkup basically with their doctor and the doctor talks to the parent about oral health, about not putting the baby to sleep with a bottle, about brushing the teeth, sure. and then they say, is it okay if I put some fluoride on the teeth to make them stronger? And the parent can absolutely say no if they want to. Right. In, our, in our county, some people do. And you know, our, my job like is me. to educate and uh, to offer it. And if they want to refuse it, it's their right to refuse. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Supervisor Cobb and Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, just briefly, um, I'm glad you offer parents fluoride uh, for their for their children, and I just want to say, you know, one of the things I really appreciate the approach of this is that um, you're moving towards towards real goals, and each one of those percentages means a kid has longer mm -hmm. uh, has better health um, and a better life, and so the percentages are great, and that and it translates into lives. I also want to say I really appreciate that you're using both, you know, big programs of the Live Oak um, uh, Health Center and expansions in South County, but you're also using nudges to help educate and inform people. Um, and that combination, I think, is, is the right one where it's, it's not just all about big programs, mm -hmm. it's also about making sure people have options and are aware. Yeah. Uh, and so I really, uh, I really appreciate that, that innovative approach to, to public health. Thank you for that. We definitely feel that using the upstream approach is the way to go in addition to building clinical space because with dentistry, you have to have a visit, you have to have a checkup, you have to have at least one cleaning a year. Like you need that physical space to be able to serve patients. But at the same time, we need to educate, we need to prevent, and we need to do use those innovative approaches. When it comes to the percentages, I wanted to point out that our goal is 60% by 2020, but we have a little problem that Every year, more patients are becoming eligible for Medi-Cal, so the denominator is increasing. So even though we're seeing more and more patients, the uptick in the percentages of patients that are utilizing the surfaces may not be as high as we wanted it to be, and it's because more people are eligible. But we're going to continue to fight and continue to, to get out there and try to help people. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open it up for the community. Opportunity for the member of the community to address us on this presentation. It's a non-action item, but. Well, I do believe we should have health care for all, including oral health care. And I also agree with uh, Supervisor Caput bringing up the mandatory aspect. You said, the wording's in there, but it's really not mandatory. And I've also followed the vaccine issue and the fluoride issue. Um, these are toxins. You can read about it from sources other than the pharmaceutical industry. Since the word mandatory is problematic, it seems to me the wording should be changed to just remove the word mandatory. You said earlier you want an option for parents. We often hear of choice. So if you really believe in that, you remove the word mandatory. Regarding uh, vaccines, I'm glad you brought that up, Supervisor Cathal, when my daughter went to high school here at Aptos High years ago, I signed the waiver that I had objections, philosophical objections. Um, so um, th anyway, that's, that's my suggestion, to remove that word. I'm also, um, e e you know, you say fluoride's approved topically. Well, it's in the mouth. It, people swallow things, it gets ingested, everything's connected. And our bodies are more and more loaded with toxins, and especially the fetal development is critical. I was just watching trace amounts of film about mercury poisoning and how just the mercury filling off-gassing from the mother 
goes into the fetus, uh, the, the, and, when, and when the baby's born, uh, one of the people in the film said she had the um, baby teeth of her child uh, checked for mercury, very high. It downloads from the mother's body. Here's another thing on oral health. A friend had, she was a real estate appraiser, was on the cell phone all the time. Her teeth fell out on this side uh, where she held the cell phone. And I'm, I gave you an article by Dr. Martin Paul, the interview, he talks about I think it's called voltage gate calcium channels, how the calcium leaches out of the cells from the effects of the wireless microwave radiation. My last thing is a question. How much emphasis do you put on eating nutritious, organic, non-processed, non-sugar foods? Thank you. All right, well, we'll bring it back uh, to the board. That's not an action item, but I will take uh, the suggestion as the board's consensus to send the, the letter to these dentists that have expanded uh, access. Uh, we appreciate the presentation. Um, Science Class 101, fluoride is naturally occurring in rocks, leaches into groundwater naturally, but that's okay. We can have that debate uh, all we want. Uh, I, I think it's an important thing, but there's no action that's here. Not I would like here. to. Yeah, we're not going to do it here, but there's, there's no amendment. action on this item. I, I, I would go with the am uh, amendment to drop the word there's mandatory. No, but it, it's not. I'll this be is sure a to drop that word from my presentation. Okay, I appreciate it. This isn't a presentation that we're controlling, though. This okay. is just a presentation from a community all group. Right. Uh, but Dr. Seppi has agreed to remove one word that had absolutely no relevance in a pretty significant presentation here. So anyway, the board will uh, move into closed session. Is there anything that will be reportable at a closed session? No. All right, then we'd like to thank the Sentinel and Community TV for uh, covering today, and we appreciate dentists for all of your work. Thank you so much. Thank you.